This is a situation in Portugal, more or less the same, but in the Portuguese case, the numbers are much milder on both sides. And this is UK, as you know, there's a new government in UK, debt set on cutting budget deficit. But same story, if you add two private sector lines together, it's over 10% of GDP. Government deficit from here to here deteriorated to the tune of 7.8% of GDP, which means government is not taking up all the extra savings generated in the British private sector and putting it back into the income stream. And as you know, the British economy is shrinking. The last uh, fourth quarter number that came out in the UK actually had a negative number when the whole world is supposed to be uh, expanding. But for some reason, Mr. Mr. Cameron is insisting on continuing this path. Uh, I think he's crazy, but I shouldn't say that perhaps. Uh, <clears throat> Maybe they are hoping on one, issue, one, one, one piece of good news for them, and that is that if you look at the British pound, the exchange rate of British pound in real effective terms, it's the lowest in British history at the moment. So maybe Mr. Cameron is hoping that the UK will be able to send more Rolls Royces and Bentleys and Jaguars, and that would offset all the negatives coming from the government sector but I'm not so confident that they will be successful. Well, how about, well, Italy is more or less neutral. Greece, where all the problems started, when you look at the Greek flow of funds, you notice that there wasn't much increase in private sector savings, but there was a huge increase in government deficit. And the government never ran surplus over these few years, and they were actually lying on their numbers. So that's why Greece got hit when the new government came in October two years ago and said, sorry, folks, the numbers that the previous government announced were actually incorrect. Uh, so Greek situation is very different from all the other European countries. They really uh, got themselves in trouble by running these irresponsible deficits and not telling the truth to the, to the markets. So for the Greek case, because there's no private sector savings to finance this uh, increasing deficit, they have to rely more on foreign purchases. The foreigners are very upset with what the Greek government was doing. And so <clears throat> the Greek government really have to get its act together, win back the credibility of the people again and of the markets by reducing budget deficit. There's no two ways about it. But putting all these countries together Greece and Ireland and Spain and Portugal and then call it pigs, I think is a grave mistake. Because Greek situation is very different from others. And the other ones all have what I call balance sheet recession, where private sector is deleveraging with historically low interest rates. And they should be treated as a completely different case. Well, <clears throat> how about the United States? The epicenter of this whole, whole, whole episode. Well, if you look at the US flow funds data, and you look at the corporate line and the household line, yes, there was a big jump here, and there was a big jump here toward deleveraging, uh, trying to pay down debt. But recently, both numbers look more or less reasonable. Even though it shot up, it kind of stabilized around here. And corporate line, yes, it did shoot up, but it's kind of coming down as well. So all these people who are saying, hey, US economy is more or less out of the woods, everything is fine, we're gonna have uh, comfortable growth going forward, they are basically looking at this, these numbers on, and saying, hey, it, it's not a situation where things are, are exploding or imploding, however you look at it. Well, if you just look at those numbers, that's a conclusion one can reach. The problem is the US flow funds data for the last two years absolute garbage. <laughs> and it's sad to say that the United States, my country, have such a horrible number that you can very easily tell whether the numbers are good or bad. As I indicated to you earlier, these four lines are supposed to add up to zero. The last two years of US numbers don't add up to zero at all. Huge gaps. And <clears throat> that means one or all of these numbers are screwed up. And if we have to make judgment based on numbers that are, are incorrect, you know, in, in garbage in, garbage out, right? So what to make of this uh, screwed up numbers? 
Well, there are two ways. We want to look at what the private sector is doing. So there's two ways of looking at the private sector. You can add the blue lines and red lines together, as I did in the, in the previous ones, and came up with one number. Or you can subtract the other two, the government and the rest of the world, from zero. Because four numbers added together is supposed to be zero. So if you subtract the other two from zero, you should also get a private sector number. And what I did here is that exercise. The red line is adding the private sectors together, households, banks, and, and, and companies. Then the deleveraging is not too bad, 8.28% of GDP. And since the government increased deficit by 8.5% of GDP during this period, the two numbers more or less match. There's no deflationary gap. Economy should be stable going forward. But if you do the other calculation, subtract the other two from zero, you get this blue one. And it's 13.3% of US GDP. Massive deleveraging. Third only to Ireland and Spain. And if the blue line is the correct picture, we, have a, we still have a problem that private sector in the US is still deleveraging. And many indicators suggest that the blue line is more correct than the red line. For example, at this moment, bond yield, 10-year government bond yield in the United States is yielding 3.6%. When I enter this business, when I enter Federal Reserve Bank of New York, uh, President Reagan was running the show, and President Reagan was bashed for running a large budget deficit, so-called twin deficit. And at that time, the deficit was 8% of US GDP. And at that time, bond yield in the United States was 14%. Now, the budget deficit is 10% of GDP, or 9 to 10% of GDP, and the bond yield is 3.6%. The budget deficit as a percentage of GDP today is larger, but the bond yield is actually lower, significantly lower. How do you explain this? Well, if, if the red line is correct, you cannot explain it because actually government increased budget deficit more than private sector increased its savings. But if you believe in the blue line, where private sector in the United States are increasing savings massively, then you can explain this 3.6% bond yield. And the fact that the economy still remains weak, and not responding to all these monetary signals, all suggest that this 13% number is uh, more correct than, than the 8.3% uh, number. Well, because for my analysis, these numbers are very important, I actually went to the Federal Reserve Board in Washington and asked the people who put the, these numbers together and asked them which one is the correct one. Well. They said, sorry, our numbers are in such a horrible shape. But because in order to calculate uh, this set of statistics, people have to do all sorts of es uh, estimations. And because of so-called financial crisis since the Lehman shock, all the estimates are off. And that's why the numbers don't add up. They explained that to me. Then I asked, OK, if these numbers will be revised in the future, would the red line go to the, toward the blue or the blue toward the red? And this gentleman told me that red will move toward the blue instead of the other way around. And the reason was very simple. In order to calculate the blue line, you only need two numbers, US budget deficit and US trade deficit. These numbers are available from the primary source every month because US Customs are collecting this, Congressional Budget Office is collecting the other one. So you don't have to estimate anything. You get, you get these numbers direct. But if you are doing the private sector part, you have to go through thousands of estimates. And <clears throat> that's where all the estimation problems run into this difficulty with uh, financial crisis. And so this gentleman told me that, please wait two years. Then every, all the other numbers will come out. We don't have to use the estimate. We will have the actual number. But of course, we can't wait two years. The war will be over then. So we have to make an intelligent guess at this time, uh, whether you believe in the red line or the blue line. 
But if you are like me, believing in a blue line, then that means U.S. is not out of the woods. There, the private sector is still deleveraging, which means if the government pulls the plug going forward, the whole thing can come crashing down. And in that sense, I'm very much encouraged by the fact that uh, President Obama and the Republicans came up with this package, end of last year, which is mostly tax cuts. And tax cuts are not as effective in dealing with this type of recession uh, compared to government actually spending the money, but it's still far better than nothing. And at the moment, U.S. economy is still very much helped by the fiscal stimulus President Obama put in February of two years ago, February of 2009 because that one took a long time to, to go into the economy, and we are still benefiting from it. But this thing will eventually expire starting middle of this year, and if there's nothing to replace it, U.S. economy could still, still uh, start losing its forward momentum, especially if this private sector deleveraging is, is in place. Well, of course, there's a, those people who say, oh, come on, Americans, if they have two tequila drinks, they forget about everything and start borrowing money again. Now, if you believe in that scenario, uh, forget everything you heard here, because they, they'll be back to doing uh, all these nasty habits of the past, and the economy will be fine. Uh, but if you believe that Americans may remain cautious, <clears throat> trying to repair uh, their balance sheets, then the government will have to be in there, uh, I'm happy to note that Chairman Bernanke of the Federal Reserve, who used to who used to not believe in any of this stuff, are now c coming to this camp. Just a year ago, he would say, uh, "It's time to cut the budget deficit. Everything is fine. The Federal Reserve monetary policy can policy can carry the day." Well, he's not saying that anymore. He's saying this is no time to cut budget deficit. We still need fiscal stimulus to, to keep the economy going. And I had a fortunate uh, chance to, to talk with the chairman because we were both invited to testify. You know, the Federal Reserve chairman has to testify twice to the Congress. And I was also asked to testify with him uh, for the same testimony, so I had a chance to talk with him. And I heard him firsthand saying, to especially the Republican congressman, that this is no time to cut. We have to maintain fiscal stimulus. And on that event, uh, since I knew that I would be seeing him, I presented my book to him. This is my book. And he said, oh, I have already read it. And he said, the part on Japan was very useful. So I get the sense that he is beginning to understand this risk called balance sheet recession. And there are many other people, like Paul Krugman, who was very much against my stance 10 years ago. We had a long debate, two-hour debate, for a Japanese magazine. And he wouldn't uh, agree to anything I was saying. But now, he's quoting me on many occasions, talking about the danger of cutting the fiscal stimulus now. And Christine Romer, the former CEA chairman, often mentions uh, my name as well. So there's a group of people in the U.S. who are beginning to get this point, that when the private sector is deleveraging, when private sector is deleveraging at zero interest rates, the easiest way to describe it is that they're sick. And all these economic theories we learn in schools, where, where we assume the private sector is maximizing profits, means that they are fundamentally healthy. The balance sheet has no problems, they can borrow money, they can move forward. But once in every several decades, when there's a massive bubble financed with debt, and when that bubble burst, we get into this problem. But this is not in economics yet. And so even though some people in the policy circles, some people in academia are beginning to notice that maybe something uh, is here, the average public is nowhere near where I like them to be. I mean, they still remember what they learn in schools, budget deficit is a bad thing, it crowds out private sector investments, misallocation of resources, possibly inflationary, higher interest rates, all these bad things. And it's so much more, it sounds so much more correct to say, hey, let's not leave any debt to our children or grandchildren. It's so difficult to say, 
no, we, we need the government borrowing and spending money. And I know how difficult it is because I've been doing that in Japan for the last 20 years. And I've been bashed and bashed and bashed. The last 10 years, I was not able to appear on Japanese television at all. And that's the problem all these governments are having all around the world today, trying to convince people that that's the right thing to do. Gordon Brown failed miserably. Uh, Obama lost the midterm election. Entire Europe is heading the opposite direction. And <clears throat> some years ago, uh, sorry, last year, I was invited by K uh, King's College Cambridge University in the UK to give this talk. So I went there, there's a so-called Keynes Hall inside the King's College, and there's a big bronze bust of Keynes next to me, and I was giving this talk, and I said, you know, it's very difficult to maintain fiscal stimulus in a democracy during peacetime. If it's a wartime, no problem. But in the peacetime, it's very difficult because in democracies, it's one side is for fiscal stimulus, the other side is always for fiscal consolidation. And you go back and forth, back and forth. You can never maintain fiscal stimulus uh, any length of time. After the talk, someone, an old gentleman, came up to me, a scholar of Keynes, who said, you know what? Keynes said exactly the same thing on exactly the same spot you are standing now, 1940. So that's a problem we face. In a democracy, it's very difficult to maintain fiscal stimulus in a peacetime. And that's why in a situations like this, the balance sheet recessions that we are in now, it takes democracies much longer to pull itself out. It took Japan 15 years. If similar mistakes are made in U US and Europe, it may take just as long. I hope that's not going to be the case. Uh, but it's hard to, hard to think that somehow Europeans will get this and start moving in the opposite direction. How about China? Well, China is one country that paid attention to this chart long before anyone else. Long before Martin Wolf and Paul Krugman started paying attention to my work, China was studying this very, very carefully. Because five years ago, China had both the housing bubble and the stock market bubble. So they were somewhere here. And when, whenever I use this, my, my presentation, I've been using this chart for the last 10 years, Chinese people ask me to come over to China many times to explain how this was done. Because when you are here, and if you are Chinese leadership, you're not elected by the people. You dump communism in a garbage can. You have no legitimacy in the ordinary sense of the word. The only way these people claim legitimacy is that under their leadership, living standard of the Chinese people improved dramatically. That's the source of their legitimacy. But if that improvement had a large component of bubble in it, one day the bubble will burst and living standard will start uh, collapsing or will fall by, by that amount of, of the bubble. At that time, you could not suddenly say, oh, that was bubble, it's not our fault. Because people expected you to be the key uh, supporter of this living standard, and if living standard going the opposite direction, since you're not elected by the people, if you're elected by the people, you could still say, oh, come on, but I have two more years, you shut up. I have a mandate of the people, or something like that. Uh, but if you're not elected by the people, and you're not practicing communism anymore, you are in the trouble. And Chinese, when they saw this chart, realized that, gee, Japan managed to keep the GDP from falling. GDP from falling means the average public had their income. In spite of this massive collapse in asset prices. And so they studied my example very carefully. This book was translated into Chinese long before Paul Krugman's and others stopped paying attention to it in the West. You can buy the, my Chinese translation in Beijing Airport, Shanghai Airport. It's all piled very high. And it's published by the publisher that used to publish the Little Red Book of Mao. <laughs> so you know where it's coming from. Uh, so 
they understand this inside out. And when I said Prime Minister Aso of Japan had to convince 18 countries in the G20, why did I say 18 and not 19? Because China already knew it. Four days before the emergency G20 meeting in Washington, China announced that massive 4 trillion yuan fiscal stimulus package and implemented right away. At that time, when China said, we're going to maintain 8% growth, everybody in the world was laughing. No way you can maintain 8% growth, the whole export market collapsing, no way. No one's laughing now. Because that fiscal package, implemented very quickly, basically allowed Chinese economy to, to bounce off. And because China is a dictatorship, they can maintain this fiscal stimulus as long as they want. If someone complains, grab him in jail, put him in jail, and that's the end of the story. So dictatorships, if the dictators got the right ideas, they can maintain this fiscal stimulus, and they typically do better in the balance sheet recession compared to democracies where you always go back and forth and you can never have a consistent policy in place. Well, China has one other problem on top of it, actually, which I never anticipated. In November 2008, uh, they not only put in the massive fiscal stimulus, but they also told the banks to lend as much as possible. But in the balance sheet recession, and China, November 2008, was heading toward the perfect balance sheet recession because both house prices and uh, equity prices were falling. In balance sheet recession, you're not supposed to have any borrowers. So monetary policy should be largely irrelevant. But in China, there was a borrower. Regional governments, provincial governments. Prior to November 2008, uh, because regional governments are all competing with each other, and they tend to go crazy doing things, Central government issued uh, an order to prohibit banks from lending too much money to provincial governments and from provincial governments from borrowing too much money. Those regulations were in there. But November 2008, with Lehman Brothers collapsing and then the whole, wor whole world economy going down with it, the Chinese government said, oh, maybe it's okay. Regional governments can borrow, banks can lend. And wham, huge amount of money was lent to the regional governments. They used it to start all sorts of mega projects they had in mind. And that's, that money is then entering the uh, private sector. And we have a huge housing bubble in Beijing, Shanghai, all these places. Some ordinary apartment in Shanghai is said to be over 1 million US dollars. And now the Chinese government is worried about this problem. Because if this thing stays, there will be another different kind of revolt from the public who, who can never afford a, a decent housing. And so now they're going to uh, crash in this bubble and raising rates, raising reserve requirements, raising loan to value ratios. Uh, and I think this time these guys are pretty serious. So I think we are going to see some blood in the, in the Chinese real estate market, developers, uh, all those people who are related to that, that industry. But at the same time, this will be a rebalancing recession in, in that part of China, but I think they will offset that by increasing the fiscal spending on this side, so that overall growth will be, will be largely unaffected. But if you are in a housing market or something in, in Shanghai or something, then you should be a little careful going forward, because I think this time the government is very serious. So that's the Chinese story, in that they understand this fully, they're doing everything right. Uh, they have this housing bubble problem that they're going, going after, but because they can continue with the fiscal stimulus, overall growth should be reasonably, uh, I mean, it, it shouldn't be like double digit that we saw a little earlier, that was too much and inflation rates are picking up, but something like 8% growth they should be able to maintain, even with uh, a bubble bursting in some, some cities. Uh, I'm rapidly running out of time, but how about Japan? Well, 
Japan had this huge deleveraging on the corporate sector after the bursting of the bubble. These guys used to borrow something like 12% of GDP. They were paying down debt to the tune of 12% of GDP. So all the, the gap between from here to here was, was absolutely massive, over 20 some percent of GDP. And that's how Japanese economy, that, that's the reason why Japanese economy was weak for so long. All the companies that were supposed to borrow and spend were actually paying down debt. And then after that repayment peaked, you see this line coming back. And I was hoping that this line will go, <clears throat> go below zero, and then we are back to the normal world. Well, Lehman shock hit when that was about to happen. And Japanese companies, on their self-defense, suddenly increased their savings again, which I thought was very, very unfortunate. Uh, but I would argue that this is probably just a knee-jerk reaction of sorts, because Japanese corporate balance sheets are now the cleanest in the world. Half of the listed companies have zero debt, the largest in Japanese history, which is all good. But what we are faced in Japan is that we have an exit problem. The, the Europeans and Americans have the entrance problem. Japanese have the exit problem. What is the exit problem? After this many years of debt repayment from here to here, over 10 years, paying down debt in a recession is a very, very painful experience. You have to lay off workers, restructure, all of that. These companies are saying, never again. Never want to borrow money again. And Americans who lived through the Great Depression in the 1930s, who had to pay down debt during the 1930s, never borrow money until they died. So there are still Americans age 90 and 100 still refusing to borrow money because of that, the horrible experience they went through. We have a mini version of that in Japan. Our interest rates are the lowest in the world. Bankers are most willing to lend. No borrowers, even with near zero interest rates. And we have to put in policies so that these people will get over the trauma. And I was advising Prime Minister Aso, and since Aso understood all of this, he was a businessman before, so he, maybe he screwed up his balance sheet somewhere in his career. So he understand this problem inside out. He was, he was we are uh, trying to come up with measures to encourage people to borrow money again through the kind of policies that Obama put in, you know, able to write off everything in the first year. We were think, thinking of uh, those ideas. But just as we were playing with those ideas, Lehman shock hit, as you saw earlier, Japanese industrial production fell to a level of 1983, excess capacity everywhere in the economy. There's no way you can make these guys borrow and spend money when there's excess capacity everywhere. And so the talk uh, went out of the window. And of course, now we have a different government in place who, who understand, I'm afraid, very little of what actually happened. They're asking me to give a lot of uh, briefings. So I, I'm, every time such requests come, I go and then brief officials in the new government what actually happened in the past and what are the needed policies. But they are holding the steering wheel for the first time. I mean, LDP controlled that for, for so many years. These people have zero experience. And so it may take a while before uh, they will get to, the, to this point. So please don't hold your breath waiting for, for those policies to be put in place. I don't think that will happen anytime soon. Uh, but Japan itself, given, in spite of this, this uh, trauma toward debt, which is the, the last part of getting out of what I call balance sheet recession, the economy itself is actually doing quite well in the sense that even though you hear a lot about China, you a lot hear about South Korea doing this, Taiwan doing that, Japan is the only country that's running trade surplus with all three. And that's with the very strong yen that you see today. So at the most fundamental level, Japan still got the technology, still got the material, still got all the <clears throat> know-how that are now going into all the products made in South Korea, Taiwan, and China. I'm sure you have seen this article from Wall Street Journal looking into what's actually in iPod, or iPhone, sorry. And the largest components were all coming from Japan, 33% of the total 
Chinese input was less than well, less than four percent, and the, the others were coming from Taiwan, Korea, and so forth. But the fact that Japan is running trade surplus with both Taiwan and Korea means that Taiwanese and Koreans are using Japanese components, Japanese equipment, or Japanese materials to fabricate things that then goes into to iPhones. What that means is that if you count those as Japanese inputs, then the Japanese inputs are actually very, very high. But because the final product says assembled in China or made in China, so you hear much less of, of Japanese band names these days, and people somehow concluded that uh, Japan is finished because of the aging population or something. Well, we are not there yet. Uh, these numbers suggest that a lot of things made in, in Asia, a vibrant part of uh, Asia, are actually made in Japan. But they have assembled in, in uh, Korea, Taiwan, and, and in China. So at the micro level, Japanese companies are doing fine. And given that these uh, trade surpluses are actually growing, means that as Asia, the, Asia and China do better, Japan will, as a result, do increasingly better as well. Uh, but in terms of a macro picture, we need to get these companies to borrow a little more money so that the economy as a whole will be more normal uh, going forward. But my sense is that not only Japan will have this problem, but Europe and United States may soon have this problem as well. But, uh, I mean, this problem, uh, problem of companies not borrowing money. Because once you go through this balance sheet repair process, you become so sick of this whole process, and the trauma sets in, and it takes a long time to pull these people out. For those of you who are old enough to remember, I don't know whether <clears throat> you're aware of this, but until mid-1980s, every interest payment was tax deductible in the United States. Whether it's car loans or from consumer in the, or credit card, everything was tax deductible. And by middle 1980s, they realized that that was crazy, so they removed all of that, and only the house mortgage is tax, still tax deductible in the United States. But that's the kind of measures needed to get the Americans to borrow money again after the Great Depression. And we might have to put in something close to it in Japan, and other countries may have to do the same eventually uh, if they end up going through this process longer than necessary. So uh, I hope I'm wrong in all of this. Uh, and I hope this two tequila drink argument is the correct one. But given all these numbers at the moment, even though yes, US economies are picking up steam and so forth, I think we should be careful. We shouldn't drop our guards because if the government become too complacent, as happened in Japan 1997, and pull the plug prematurely, the whole thing can come crashing down again. Thank you very much.